So good morning, everybody. One more seminar from IIA. Today we will have the talk of Dr. Gary Fuller, Peering into the Dark, Probing the Formation and Early Evolution of uh, Massive Stars. Uh, a good presentation of Gary Fuller uh, will be given by Gijem. Please, Gijem. Jim is not here. So Jim went out. Gary, can you make your own presentation because I don't have, I do not have any information on you. Okay, I can introduce myself. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm Gary Fuller. I'm a professor of astrophysics at the University of Manchester. I've been there since 1996. Before that, I did my PhD in Berkeley in California and then was a postdoc at NRAO Jansky Fellow and the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Um, currently, I'm in Granada, IAA, IAA. Um, on sabbatical until December, uh, supported both by IAA and the Sarah Ochoa program. And Gwilym is my host in what during this sabbatical. So firstly, I'd like to thank you, them for supporting me and letting me sit here and, and do some research. Do you want me to start the presentation? Yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, Sorry, if you want my to... computer crashed and I had to restart it. <laughs> yeah, but I, from what I heard, I think Gary says essentially what I'm planning to, to say. Uh, he's on sabbatical here at the IAA and uh, he's also a Severo Choa visitor. And he recently has been appointed as doctor vinculado to our institute. So, welcome, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. As I said, thank you for, for hosting me while I'm here. Okay, so I'm going to talk about peering into the dark and hopefully why I use that phrase will become a little clearer as we go into the, into the presentation. Uh, I should of course say that a lot of this work is done by my collaborators, my students, my postdocs. Um, they do all the work, and of course all the errors are mine, so I apologise for those. Okay. okay, just give you a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'll give a brief introduction uh, to why I'm interested in massive star formation, and then spend the rest of the talk talking about, firstly, massive clumps, and in particular one object, which is called SDC-335. Then talk about some objects which are similar, but we believe less evolved. And then in the last part of the talk, I want to talk a little bit about how we're trying to understand uh, the evolution of massive protostars and the serv an ALMA survey that I lead called TEMPO. Okay, so why are massive stars important? Firstly, what I mean by massive star, and I mean a star who's on the main sequence has a mass of eight solar masses or more. So they're massive enough to become supernovae at the end of their lives and their death. Um, they're important because they dominate their environments. Massive stars like this have huge outputs of both radiative and kinetic energy in terms of their winds. So they very much dominate what's going on around them. They sculpt the clouds they form in, have an impact on the current star formation and the future star formation. <clears throat> Ultimately, when these stars are on the main sequence and have strong UV outputs, they 
<coughs> ionizer environment, which puts the ends of star formation in the clouds. But in the process of doing that, they might compress cloud regions, they might cause material to be gathered up, and in fact might enhance star formation. So ultimately, they must have a negative feedback effect, but they might have a transitory positive feedback effect in enhancing star formation. And just to give you an example, this picture down here in the lower right is, of course, from Hubble, beautiful image of the pillars of creation. Um, the reason this image looks so beautiful is because of the massive stars that you can't see in this region, but which are illuminating this molecular cloud, or this remnant of a molecular cloud, and destroying it. So this is an example not of massive star formation, but an example of massive stars which have formed previously impacting their environment and changing things. So as well as that, uh, massive stars are important for driving chemical evolution in the galaxy and other galaxies. They produce long-lived radioactive isotopes like aluminium, iron and cobalt. And just to show you that, this is a really beautiful image of the periodic table color coded by where elements come from. And so you can see that anything that's this light blue color or this pink color needs massive star formation. So we need massive stars to form supernovae to produce things like oxygen, fluorine, aluminium, sodium, and a good fraction of the carbon. And their remnants, the neutron stars that are the remnants of those super, of some of those supernovae to produce these much heavier elements. Um, so, as I just said, that these massive stars are also the progenitors of neutron stars, black holes, and gamma ray bursts. And so, if you want to understand the populations of these kinds of objects, you need to understand how the progenitors, the young massive stars I'm interested in, formed. Of course, it is these massive stars that reionize the universe with redshift greater than five. And when you're looking at high redshift galaxies in the optical and infrared, this, these are the stars whose light you're most sensitive to. But these high mass stars are, are difficult to form. So this is the equation here is the Kelvin Helmholtz time. So it's basically the time it takes uh, a forming star to radiate away its gravitational energy so it can contract onto the main sequence. And you can see that for one solar mass star, this is tens of millions of years. And so if you look in the HR diagram, you can see young low mass stars contracting, radiating away their gravitational energy to become main sequence stars. Those contracting stars are Tutori stars. And you can see them because it's a long lived phase. But for a 10 solar mass star, for example, this is a much shorter time. This is more like um, 60,000 years, which is very different to um, 30, uh, 30 million years. So these high mass stars form very fast, which is a challenge. It's a challenge to understand how that happens because, for example, the accretion rates you need over this 10 to the 4, 6 times 10 to the 4 years to form this 10 solar mass star is about 2 times 10 to the minus 4. And it's also a challenge observationally because high mass stars are rare. Remember the IMF, uh, the, the number of high mass stars is much less than the number of low mass stars. So if you want to find young objects, you need to have large samples because those young high mass stars are rare in themselves and evolve quickly. And also the implication there is that these stars are on average much further away in our galaxy than low mass star, young low mass stars. So they're rare, they evolve fast, and they're typically further away. So this mass accretion rate is hard to understand too. For low mass stars, the accretion rate to form a solar mass star is about 10 to the minus solar masses a year. And if you look at a very simple, straightforward theory of how 
low mass stars might accrete. You can write down a simple equation for um, the mass accretion rate. It's just the sound speed Q over G with a factor of the unity. And if you plug those numbers in, you get that scale to the temperature to the one half. This should be solar masses here. So. And if you just plug in the 10 Kelvin, which is a typical temperature for molecular gas in the galaxy, then you get a mass accretion rate that's like this value for low mass stars. If you want to form a high mass star with a simple model, then you need much, much higher temperatures, temperatures of hundreds of Kelvin, which just is not consistent with the bulk of molecular gas in the galaxy. So how do you get these high M dots that you need? And also, how is the mass accumulated? How do you actually gather to get, gather together the mass out of which a high mass star is going to form? <coughs> Another issue is the scale size of the fragmentation that you get as these clouds that form high mass stars collapse. Again, it's a very simple argument. You can write down the genes mass and in terms of the temperature and the density. So the genes mass for a 10 K clump of gas at a density of 10 to the four is about five solar masses. And that matches well with the kinds of fragments we see in, for example, nearby low mass star forming regions like Taurus. So here's one mapped in ammonia a long time ago. But what about massive regions? Massive regions have similar temperatures, about 10K on average, higher densities. But if the high densities are higher, then the genes mass is lower. So these high density regions fragment into lower mass clumps, lower mass cores. So how do those low mass cores form high mass stars? And there is some evidence to suggest, and here's a couple of examples on the bottom, that in fact, there may be massive cores. So why don't they fragment? What's preventing these apparently high mass cores fragmenting? Or in fact, do they fragment? That this is just, we don't yet have enough resolution in this region to see what's going on. So, um, my cartoon view of massive star formation. The real question is how do you concentrate a lot of mass into a small volume? How much mass do you need to get into a particular volume? We know that down at the star you need to get in um, 10 solar masses or so, but when does that mass get there and where does it come from? And just to give you an idea of the sort of the geometry, sorry, geography of star forming regions. Here's a little cartoon showing a clump, which is what we'll call a, part, a few parsec size region. Within that clump, there are cores, which are fractions of a parsec in size, so high density concentrations, which will be where individual stars or small groups of stars are formed. And these clumps are often connected well, they are connected to the larger scale environments, often through filamentary structures. And so you can ask questions like, for example, are these cores that we see, that I showed you an example of a few moments ago, finite reservoirs? So do, to form a 10 solar mass star, do you gather 10 solar masses of material into a core, have it collapse and form a star? Or are they transient structures? Does the material pass through these cores on the way to the star? But all we're doing here is picking out high density regions that aren't physically distinct objects. Uh, so you can, I, I've listed on the right some models or interpretations of what's going on. So for example, the concept of monolithic collapse, that these, core, these cores are indeed finite mass reservoirs that control the star formation. And if that's the case, then for example, the mass distribution of these cores in a region tells you something about what the initial mass function for stars forming in those regions is going to look like. If they're not, then you can ask the question, 
is the mass distribution really coupled to the distribution of the mass distribution of the stars that form? Uh, this concept of global collapse, you know, Rowan Smith and uh, Ian Bennell talked about where you have these whole regions collapsing simultaneously to form stars. It's not these individual cores that collapse in the static environment. It's a much more dynamic process. And you can capture, encapsulate those ideas into this um, core fed accretion versus clump fed accretion idea. Okay, a clump fed accretion. So is the mass that comes from the stars fundamentally from finite reservoir cores or from this global environment? Okay, so how, where do you want to look to try and start answering these questions? And I think the answer is you want to look where the light isn't, hence peering into the dark. Why? Because the beautiful images I showed you, for example, from HST of a star, massive star forming region, what you're seeing is feedback. You're seeing feedback from the already formed stars. You want to really identify the conditions for massive star formation. You want to look where that feedback hasn't happened yet. And so you want to look where there isn't actually much emission. One that describes what we see in dark clouds seen in absorption against the infrared background, IRDCs, infrared dark clouds. They were first detected by ISO back in the mid 1990s. It was weird because suddenly it was here in late <laughs> uh, And the first extensive catalog was produced from the MSX satellite. There been many papers looking at this, many groups working on this. But back in the early 2000s, uh, we realized that the Spitzer Glimpse. Uh, survey provide an opportunity for a high resolution, higher sensitivity survey looking for these infrared dark clouds. So uh, we published in 2009 a catalogue where we took these eight micron absorption images that we identified in the Spitzer catalogue and turned them in to a catalogue of infrared dark clouds. So this is one slightly filamentary region. And this is now a contour map of the column density in that region that we derive from this absorption map. I should say we took a very pragmatic approach to identifying clouds. We basically define them as connected regions with high eight micron optical depth, um, larger than four arc seconds. And this corresponds to regions with column densities greater than 10 to the 22 per square centimeter and peak column density is about twice that. So since then, we've been, we've been mining this catalog, using it as a source of objects to look at in other studies. This is one of the first objects we've looked at in, de we looked at in detail. This is a thing called SDC 335, SDC Spitzer Dark Cloud. Uh, the image at the top is an eight micron image and you can see the absorption against the background and combined with that is a 24 micron image which shows these two bright sources in the center. This region has what's called a hub filament um, geometry. There's a hub here that's surrounded by radiating filaments. So this region's a few parsecs in size, contains about five and a half thousand solar masses in total, two and a half thousand solar masses in the central region. And we observed it with ALMA in cycle zero. In fact, this is one, this is the first ALMA science observation. In fact, formerly our first set of data came from the day before ALMA officially started science observations. And what we detected is shown down here on the left hand side and the right hand of these two panels shows the dust continuum emission. And these two objects, this object here rather, is this object here, MM1, and this object, MM2, is the secondary source up here. And these are extremely massive plump, uh, cores. So. so these are regions about 0.05 parsecs in size. Uh, 
MM1 has something like four or 500 solar masses material. And if you go to higher resolution than our initial ALMA data and look in the radio continuum, you can in fact identify three high mass protostars in this region, one in MM2 and two in MM1 down here. So the, the purple contours are 20 gigahertz continuum from ACTA in Australia. The crosses are methanol mazes, class two methanol mazes that trace the presence of high mass protostars. So this one region is forming three OB stars. If you assume that this region is actually going to form stars with uh, an IMF's worth of mass distribution, that implies that there should be something like 50 to 61, so 50 to 60 stars with masses greater than one solar mass forming in this region. We don't yet see evidence of those low mass star formation regions. Um, we have got higher resolution data and there's very little evidence for significant fragmentation. So although it's forming OB stars, we don't yet see what we would expect from this region. But if you take this expectation, then you're gonna end up with a total stellar mass in this region of something like 300 solar masses. That's less than 10% of the total mass in this region. A star formation efficiency over the lifetime of this region of only 10% is extremely low for a region of this high density. If you take a more reasonable factor, which is say 30% efficiency, it implies the total stellar mass we'll get in from this um, hub filament structure is something like 1,700 solar masses. So in other words, this is a region that's in the process of forming an OB association. Uh, we can see on a larger scale evidence of this. This is, a, this is a map of spectra towards this region. This is HCO class one to zero. And if you look at this line, it has a very characteristic shape of a bright blue shifted peak and then a weaker red shifted peak. This is the so-called asymmetry due to infall. Um, I point out a paper up here by um, Willem rather a long time ago that discusses this. But the point is you can fit models of the infall of this region. And what you've got here in the top left-hand corner now is not a map, it's a grid of models on top of the central spectrum. And that lets us estimate the rate at which this whole region, this whole 5,000 solar mass region, is infalling. <clears throat> and the answer is it's infalling with a speed of about 0.7 kilometers per second. So this entire 5,000 solar mass region is collapsing down as it is also forming these massive stars. Uh, if you look at the filaments that we see in this region, you can get an estimate for the inflow rate through them. And you find that the mass inflow rate is something like 10 to the minus three solar masses per year. So that is somewhat larger than the value I said we need to form high mass stars. So in the, 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 this kind of infall rate says that you're gonna gather something like 300 solar masses of material into the central region in a few times 10 to the five years. However, only about 20% of the mass in this region is actually in the filaments. So if you're correct for that, the global infall rate in SDC 335 is about five times 10 to the minus three solar masses. And if you look at simulations, the, the infall rate is actually larger off of the filaments because the filaments only occupy a very small fraction of the volume. So indeed, we do see regions where we see infill rates consistent with the fact they're forming high mass stars. Another way to look at the infill rates is to look at the outflows. We've now got a paper that's just been submitted that takes this region and looks at the outflows detected with ALMA in this region. There are three of them. There is this one here. There's one perpendicular to it, and there's a third one over from MM2. 
if you measure the power in the outflows, particularly for MM, the two components in MM1, this is a plot of the uh, force in the CO outflow versus the volumetric luminosity of sources. The background dots are various surveys. The marked squares are MM1, A, B, and 2 in SDC 335. And the green horizontal tracks are tracks for the formation of massive protostars from Molinari and his collaborators. And you can see MM2 is the least massive of them, but is consistent within these models to form an eventually something like a 20 solar mass star. MM1 and 2 are forming something much higher in mass. So you can take the outflow velocity, and the outflows are driven by uh, the very inner regions of the disks around these objects. And models and simulations show that the outflow rate is to the infall rate in this circumstellar environment. So, in fact, we can use this figure here to estimate the inflow rates into these individual sources. And globally, Individually, there are a few times 10 to the minus 3. Uh, MM2, which is what's called C here, is somewhat less. And overall, it's a few times 10 to the minus 3, which is consistent with the global inform rate of this whole region. And don't forget, we're, we're, we're probing very different size scales here. The, this M dot here is right very close to the star. The M dot we were getting for the clump is on a much larger scale scale. But it's interesting to note that it looks like there's a continuity of the M dots all the way from the clump scale down to the individual star scale. Let's skip over this. Okay, so uh, one thing we can get out of a survey from infrared dark clouds is that we can start identifying extreme objects. So this is a plot of surface density versus mass. Oops. The dark points here are the values for the inner region of SDC 335 and the whole region. And the key point is that we can identify within this region other objects that look like SDC 335 in terms of their mass and their surface density, but we call them starless initially. Uh, what they actually are are perhaps quiet often seen in absorption at 70 microns. So very high density, very high column density, opaque regions. So we've been carrying out a study of a number of these. Um, this is work with Anasio Traficanti, um, where we selected a number of objects which are massive on the scale of the clump, 300 to 2,000 uh, solar masses, high column density, but very low L over M. And so here's an example where you can see the column density map shown in contours derived from Heigel. This region is seen in absorption at 24 microns and 70 microns. Uh, one very interesting thing here is we'll be able to look at the asymmetry of the spectral lines. So this is a plot of the surface density of the region versus a measure of the line asymmetry. So down here, low values of this asymmetry parameter, the lines look Gaussian. Or up here, the lines look asymmetric. Uh, many of the lines are blue asymmetric, like this one, for example. Uh, this is, in fact, a region called SDC24. And so these regions are consistent with having infall in them. Um, I should say not all of these lines are blue asymmetric, some of them are red asymmetric, but it's very clear that these high surface density regions are dy more dynamically active than the low surface density regions down here. We don't see asymmetric lines at all down here. So this suggests that the, the dynamics is really important for the formation of these high density regions that global infall might be a prerequisite for forming these wet regions. So here's that region I just mentioned, SDC 24. It's a very massive 
plump, 2,000 cell masses, very low luminosity, 300 L sun, in a filamentary structure. Again, a map of the pollen density and the 70 micron emission, and you see there is no 70 micron emission. That was a little bit of a bullshit. At 24 microns, it gets a little more confusing. We start to see blobs at 24 microns, very faint objects. If we go to Alma and look in the central region, this quiescent region here contains at least three protostars, each of which are driving an outflow. Hopefully you can see two of the outflows, this one here and this one here, but we believe there's a third one as well, of which this is one of the three. So this region that looked very quiescent and may not have started to form stars yet, already actually contains young stars that are actively driving outflows and therefore by implication actively accreting in this region. I should also say this object is very strange for its luminosity in that it has a water motor as well, indicative of very strong shocks, probably related to the outflow and the informing envelopes. So we did another ALMA survey of 12 of these starless regions. So here's two examples, and you'll see that both of these regions are seen in absorption at 70 microns, but our column density peaks at 350 microns from Herschel. And with ALMA, these are very much fragmented. So of the 12 sources we looked at, 10 of them are highly fragmented. Here are two examples. And the scale size of these fragments is actually like the genes thermal, the thermal genes length. So although you might think from this image we have a massive clump, which might have a massive core in it, in fact, actually, the regions are almost all highly fragmented. So they're already starting to form stars. And these, this data set from ALMA has outflowed as traces in it. And you can see the outflows from all these sources as well. So we, despite the high densities in the region, we don't see evidence that there's, for example, additional support that forms massive cores, supports the formation of massive cores. It looks like in most regions, most because we actually do have one region that has a massive core in it, fragment into these low mass stars. And that's consistent with, with actually recent theoretical models. Uh, this, by the way, is the spectrum of STC 24 again, showing its infall profile and, and fit to that indicates an infall in this region about three times 10 to the minus five. So very similar to STC 335. Uh, so simulations, Theoretical arguments now suggest that, in fact, the objects that become high mass stars start off as low mass stars, and the ones that accrete fastest and for the longest time become high mass stars. So this is a simulation from Rowan Smith. This is dynamical time in her model, actually, it's two simulations. And this dotted line is a measure of the mass of the most massive object in the simulation. And you can see both these simulations form 10 solar mass stars approximately, but they basically start off as low mass objects and accrete their, their material as the rest of the cloud collapsing around them. So perhaps that's what we're seeing in these highly fragmented regions. So will these stars, even in the highly fragmented regions, form to grow massive, uh, so grow to form massive stars? That's a really interesting question, but we have a problem. We don't have a way yet to look at the evolutionary status of high mass stars. Low mass protostars, you have a really nice cartoon image here, which matches the observations from the collapse of a core in a class zero stage through the formation of the central protostar with outflow and inflow, an object surrounded by a disk of its cores being formed, and eventually a relatively evolved young star with a protoplanetary disk around it. We don't have such a, a classification or cartoon for high mass star forming regions. One way you can try to, to do that is to look at the chemistry of the environment around, around high mass stars. So this is a cartoon from Herbst and van der Schoek, so giving you that idea that as you move from the cold outer environments 
pre-collapse environments into the inner regions of the central protostar. You have dust grains, which get ices formed on them, they get frosty. In that, that frost, you can get chemistry going on, forming interesting molecules. As those dust grains get moved further in, closer to a forming protostar, they get warmed up. That drives additional chemistry and importantly, pushes back, uh, evaporates the ices and puts back those molecules back into the, into the circumstellar environment. So that hopefully you could try to use this chemical evolution to study the evolution of these high mass protostars. So on the right hand side here is an example of a model I uh, think this is Schrammer, 2008, looking at the gas phase evolution of various species. In, in this scenario, as you turn on a high mass protostar, and for example, this dotted line here is diethylether. So you can see how its abundance increases with time, and you see a similar effect for methanol. Notice that time here corresponds to increased temperature as well. So here's another model. This is by uh, Rob Garrod. Just, just showing three species here. Uh, methanol in blue, uh, formaldehyde in orange, and dimethyl ether in green. Uh, again, just to remind you that the temperature increases as you go to the right here with time. And you can see that, for example, we are seeing um, you could try to identify objects which have high ratios of formaldehyde to methanol as young objects and objects where you see that switch where the methanol becomes more abundant would be more evolved objects. So using, you know, based on these kinds of models, we undertook a, an ALMA survey called TEMPO, tracing the evolution of massive protostellar objects where we've looked at 39 sources chosen to span a range of luminosities consistent with young high mass stars, have a range of infrared colors, be relatively close, so near within five kiloparsecs, and be isolated so that we weren't confused by clustered regions, and preferentially to have a methanol maser. A methanol maser is a well-known tracer of young high mass stars which is the only place they can be excited because of their requirements for a um, strong 70 micron radiation field. All of the sources selected from the expected dark cloud catalog in the survey have masses more than 500 solar mass. Uh, so these were observations obtained in ALMA cycle three, not particularly high spatial resolution, about one arc second, not particularly high spectral resolution, about 1.2 kilometers a second. And those choices were made because we wanted to look at the overall abundance of these chemical species in these regions and focus on the circumstellar region without dissecting it too much. Uh, so this just shows you the spectral lines we couldn't think to be detected. Um, this is a quote actually comes from Adam Averson, who works for me in the UK Alma Nova. Uh, from some anonymous observer he was supporting. The only thing worse than not getting your ALMA data proposal accepted is getting your ALMA proposal accepted. Why? Because you end up with beautiful data. So this is just an example of six sources of one quarter of the spectra that we get from our ALMA survey. And the problem is there are a lot of molecular lines in here, which means a lot of analysis. Uh, the first bit of analysis we did was in fact to try and identify the continuum emission in these regions. So Adams worked on that. So this is a, an example of is eight regions showing the continuum emission in our objects. They are typically dominated by a single bright source, which is what we were aiming for. But as you can see, there are all kinds of other structures in here. Adam's been looking at these, and in the 38 fields, we detect something like 250 sources, 
in average, that's about seven sources per field. Um, but they are always dominated by a single bright central source. Uh, we've been looking at the nearest neighbor statistics for these objects, and in particular, looking at this thing called the Q parameter. I'm not going to go through this, but let me just say that this Q parameter, in principle, can distinguish between whether things fragment in a fractal manner or whether they correspond to a centrally condensed smooth cluster. Uh, so we've constructed the minimum spanning trees for the fragments we see. So these are the objects, which will always remind me of constellations. So I particularly like this one, which to me looks like a radio telescope. Okay, here's the bottom line. So this on the y-axis is that Q parameter. And the key thing is in all the previous works on this, the Values less than 0.8 correspond to fractal uh, fragmentation, and values greater than 0.8 correspond to smooth power law distributions. So what you might argue is that all of these objects are consistent with fractal. However, maybe not. The reason I say that is we ran a huge number of simulations looking at the samples we've got, and the issue is that, in fact, actually we have relatively few objects in our field. And that means, in fact, we're not very sensitive to this. So these single point, single field ALMA observations can't actually distinguish between these two scenarios. So we can't tell you whether these objects are fractally or power law clustered. We need wider field observations. What we can tell you is about the molecules in these regions. So this little graphic shows you the molecules we've detected, 15 species so far. Uh, there's a color code here. Uh, the ones in light green object are lines in particular objects which we've modeled in detail. A few of them require two components. The red thing, the red squares are, are species we didn't detect in a given object. So you can see we have line four objects, number 30, for example, where we detected just two species, CH3, CCH, methylacetylene, and methanol, and that was the only object, and objects that are line rich, like 17, where we detected all of these species. And this work, I should say, is from a P uh, one of my PhD students in Naomi. So we can do things like this, looking at the evolution looking at the temperature and excitation, sorry, the temperature and column density of, in this case, methanol. And you can see that we have a low temperature sample, and that low temperature sample are predominantly objects that don't have methanol masers, and we have a high temperature, high abundance group. Look at another species, this is H2CS, TL formaldehyde. So this is light formaldehyde, but with sulfur as opposed to oxygen. And you see a similar pattern. You see a low column density group, which have low temperatures, and a much higher column density group, which have somewhat higher temperatures. So this group here, for example, uh, have a ratio of theophylmaldehyde to methanol that is much larger than this group here, the higher column density regions which is perhaps reminiscent of what we see in the models, where in this part, so perhaps this high theophylmaldehyde methanol group are in fact younger objects. And that's consistent with some work that Beth Jones has done, looking at a PCA analysis of the methanol multi-beam survey, where she's identified as a group of objects that look like methanol maser sources that might in fact be younger objects. And uh, looking at these models in another way, this is now comparing ketene and methanol. So the red points are methanol, so here the low temperature, low abundance, high temperature, high abundance regions, and the ketene in between those. The curves here are the models, and you can see within the 
scope of comparing models and observations. This model for the methanol does a reasonable job. This model for the ketene does a reasonable job in predicting an abundance for these low temperature, low abundance species. But it also predicts the presence of higher temperature ketene, which we just don't see in the models. So there's a lot of scope for improving these models, but perhaps there's some hope of disentangling the evolution of these objects. So I'd just like to say that this is only a tiny fraction of the, work, the data in this, in this survey. This is one object in a methanol line, and all we've looked at so far is this central bright source. Many of these lines have extended components. This is a methanol line in this object, this is an outflow. So this is an exceptionally rich data set to explore. So let me summarize. Uh, we've been studying precursors to uh, OB associations. It looks like global info is a key feature to this, that these high mass, high density regions seem to have a lot of dynamics going on in them that you don't see in the lower density regions. We find lots of low luminosity, small sources in what we previously called starless, but perhaps might better be called quiet, uh, massive clumps. And this raises the question of whether these are going to become massive protostars. Uh, we see early stage thermal fragmentation in these regions. It would be nice to be identified which of these objects could eventually become massive stars. Uh, one way we're trying to understand the evolutionary sequence for these objects is by looking at their chemistry, looking at when we start to see complex species once the stars turn on. And we have a very rich ALMA survey of massive protostar evolution. So it's taken us so far three years to get as far as we have with the TEMPO survey. Um, Naomi can tell you about the problems of fitting these spectra that you're seeing flash up on the left hand side. But the next step is already in progress. Uh, I'm part of the ALMA GAL survey, which is a, a la ALMA large program to look at a thousand high gal sources of ALMA in band six, so one millimeter. Uh, this program was running on ALMA when it closed down because of the COVID-19 crisis, but we, are, we have some of the initial data and we're working on it now. And these data are also in band six, so very comparable to my tempo survey. I should say, sorry, the, the PIs of Alma Gal are Sergio Molinari in Rome and Peter Schilke in Cologne. So, just a couple of words of thanks. As I said, this work is done in collaboration with my group in Manchester, many of whom are seen here in this very old photo that was taken before the current crisis. Uh, key collaborators, Nicola Pareto, Alessio Trafficanti, <laughs> and Sherry Green. Uh, some of these people in this group are actually in the Advanced Radio Instrumentation Group in Manchester, where we work on low noise amplifiers. That's a completely different topic. And let me again thank you for listening to my talk. Thank IAA for hosting me on my sabbatical. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Gary, for this very nice uh, seminar, very nice, interesting talk. And the talk now is open for questions. Please raise your hand and I will see here in the participant list who will want to make a question to Gary. I had a question. This is Mayra. Gary, thank you very much for this nice um, seminar about the first phase on star formation. I had a question related with the starless massive clump SDC24, which has a very low lum luminosity, was about 300 solar luminosity. But mm -hmm, you mentioned that you are able to infer a very high mass accretion rate of the order of 10 to the minus 3 solar masses by year. But my question is, this very high mass accretion rate must imply a very high 
accretion luminosity, but we don't see this high accretion luminosity. I guess with this uh, very high mass accretion ray imply uh, luminosity of about 10 to the 4 solar luminosity, but we only see 300 uh, luminosity. Have you thought in this problem? Yeah, so, so actually that problem is easy to solve, um, and, but the implication is interesting. So the point is that 10 to the minus 3 solar masses, like in STC 335, is the inflow rate into this central region. Whoops. Okay. Uh, so into this parsec scale object, okay? Because okay. that, that's what we're sensitive to with the, the spectrum I showed. What it's not is the inflow rate into the central stars. Uh, you are assuming a very huge uh, core, no? And this uh, the, decrease the accretion luminosity according to the equation of the accretion luminosity. No. Okay. Yeah. So 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 the the just so this is like SDC uh, twenty four. So this 10 to the minus 3 here is for a part on the parsec scales. Okay. Okay, I understand now. In this one, we've actually analyzed the outflows. And for this one, we can get the M dots in these central sources. And that's what these numbers are. Okay. For SDC 24, The number I quoted is that parsec scale number. Okay. However, you're quite right. We can do the same thing for these outflows here. And then we can get an estimate of M dots onto the central star. And the interesting thing, of course, then is that the, as you say, the, the luminosity depends on M, M dot, where M is the mass of the star. Mm -hmm. So if we can measure M dot, and we know L, then in fact we can estimate M. Okay. Uh, I, I, so it, you're, you're quite right. There's a lot of interesting things to be done here. And I'm waiting for Bethany, my PhD student, to actually get some numbers out of these outflows to do mm -hmm. the same, play the same game. Okay, thank you, Maya. Any other question? Actually, I have another question, <laughs> but oh, well, yeah. I don't know. Yes, uh, 20 years ago, I was modeling the spectral energy distribution of the so-called hot molecular core by assuming a spherical one parsec collapsing envelope. And uh, we get a uh, this very high mass, uh, mass accretion rate of the order of 20 minus 3 solar mass by year, and also the free fall time of about 10, uh, about the 10,000 years. And uh, I am impressed because 20 <laughs> years later, we know that massive stars have this, and also as for we filaments. But you mentioned that these filaments only, uh, the contribution is about 20%, no? I am happy to see that uh, our results are agreed with the new results where now people know uh, many ingredients, additional ingredients in the star formation scenario. Yes, it's yeah. It's just a comment. It's a journal. A well, uh, I, I have a comment in response as well. <laughs> <Of> <laughs> Always do. Um, this looks beautiful, right? It's a beautiful region to study. There's lots of interesting stuff going on. I, I skipped over discussion of these filaments, but they show these velocity gradient. Well, actually, they, they tend not to show gradients. They tend to be at distinct velocities. It's a highly structured region. But it is true, the filaments contain only a fraction of the mass in the region. <clears throat> and so one can ask the question, 
of are these filaments the origin or the result of the collapse? Because I, another thing I didn't show. So this is a simulation um, by Patrick Embell in a paper by Nicholas Schneider, which looks remarkably like SDC 335. Okay. This is the column density map. This is the velocity map on the right hand side. You can see these things that could be filaments and you can see that they have relatively well-defined velocities. Uh, this, this one's sort of minus one and a half, this one's like plus one. Okay. Looks remarkably like the observations. But this is actually an end state. This is the end state of a collapse of an ellipsoidal cloud. And what, what these are is you know, where, the, where the, the remains of the cloud are draining in. They are not the important thing that gave the mass. And I should also say, in this, ob this, this model is specially tuned to make high mass pumps in the middle. But to do that, they actually had to put in a very steep density gradient. Which doesn't, which is a well known phenomenon to get clouds to form high mass fragments, you need to put in a density profile that's steep enough so that the gravitational potential dominates over the fragmentation. But now you know, it's a chicken and egg situation. Okay, that may be well, but how do we get substantially condensed clouds? So, clumps, we don't know. So the, the, the corollary I would say here is that there are many different types of filaments and what we're seeing here is one particular kind of filament. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have another question? Hi, dear Guillem. Thank you, Gary, for the nice talk. Uh, and in these kinds of uh, structured regions where you, you see several clumps and, well, many clumps, uh, have you uh, inferred some estimate of the initial mass function of the clumps? And, and how does it relate with the initial mass function of the stars? So, um, <coughs> I, uh, let's see, let's get back to 335. Yeah. Um, actually, let's continue. Okay. So this is our initial Alma cycle zero observations, and actually they're rather shallow, and we only detected these two clumps. There's higher resolution data available now, and you do start to see a few more clumps in this region. Region. Um, but this is a this is this one here mm1 is 400 solar masses if you run through the calculation for an imf you know and even say okay this is you know, let's not call this a few hundred so 400 solar masses let's say it's only 100 solar masses 50 solar masses there should be hundreds of a lower mass clumps and you just don't see them there's a there's a deficit of low mass cores in this region. And this is consistent, there have been several other studies of, of re high mass star forming regions. And overall, they tend to find for the earliest stages a lack of the low mass region, low mass cores. So the IMF, sorry, the, the CMF, the clump, mass function in these regions does not look like the IMF. And, and actually, we, we could have a very long chat about IMFs and CMFs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. More questions to Gary? Here, we have one. Yes, please, go on. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Raphael. Uh, thank you for your talk. 
uh, I was wondering, uh, because you, you show nice uh, clues in favor of the, the global collapse uh, scenario, uh, I would like to know basically which, what, what are the, the main questions uh, you think we should, uh, we should investigate in the years to come? Um, I'm, I'm interested in how we trace what's really going on in this region, right? Global collapse is about the, the few parsecs scale region. And you, you'll notice my MOPRA image struggles for resolution in this, this region. So I think it's connecting the, the single dish data, the relatively large scales, down to the detailed structure that we see in the dense gas. Can we actually see the infall and the <clears throat> and the flows in these filaments? Uh, and then I should say, of course, that there are ALMA programs going on to try to address that. Um, this program, Valencia Traficanti, which produced that ALMA image of SDC. 24 has 12 meter data total power, seven meter and yeah, 12 meter total power, seven meter interferometer and 12 meter interferometer to try to do just that, to do that connection. So I think that's one of the one of the questions I'd like to see answered. Um, there is this question about the fragmentation and the clump mass distribution and whether all these regions are indeed the same, right? I, I've spoken about basically two regions, but we need to understand what the statistics are. What are the global collapse typical parameters rather than just one or two examples? <clears throat> and again, Almagal, I think is gonna help us there. Uh, another example is what's causing, what, what is it that's causing this entire region to collapse? Is it colliding flows or colliding clouds? Can we say anything about the formation mechanism for these regions that puts them into this state? So there are my suggestions. Thank you. Any other question? If none, Thank you again, Gary, for this uh, very nice talk. René? Uh, yep. Uh, here's Anton. Okay, go yeah, on. No, yes, uh, let me just uh, thank uh, Gary for choosing the IAA for his sabbatical. And I hope that uh, in September, probably, the situation will become normal, let's say in that way. And we will be back, all of us, in the Institute, and then we'll have more opportunities to meet, chat, etc. In any case, thanks a lot for your talk, and I hope you will enjoy your time here in Granada, although it has been really very particular. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you very much. Again, thank you for hosting me. Um, I'm happy if anybody wants to send me an email or um, message me. Um, my email address is easy to find on the web, and I can circulate it if anyone's interested. I'm happy to talk on Zoom if we can't talk in offices or over coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you.